Um, I believe we are just about ready to interview, or not interview, but introduce <laughs> and perhaps interview <laughs> our next guest, yes. who is also one of our sisters and believers, Bailout, um, our dearest Hoda Jon. Um, Hoda Kotebi is an Iranian American writer, community organizer, and creative educator. She is the host of Hashtag Because We've Read, a radical book club and discussion series with chapters globally. She's also the founder of Blue Tin Production, an all women immigrant and refugee run apparel manufacturing workers cooperative, and also a beloved sister friend and organizer with BBO. And Hoda runs on saffron ice cream and colonizer tears. It's true. <laughs> yes, except during Ramadan, of course. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> No, absolutely. Um, so we're actually like a minute ahead. So if we want to- Perfect, I'm gonna need it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do I dive in? Yeah, yes. dive cool. in. Yes. Yay. We can dive in. We're going to leave you and then join you again at the end. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Bye. Um, salam, everyone. I'm really, really excited to be here. Thank you for everybody who has come out today, our last event, our future events. Um, yeah, today is really exciting. Happy May Day. Ah, um, so I'm going to just dive straight into this and I'm also going to share my screen. So how do I do this correctly? Sharing screen is easier with two monitors. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen and pretend application window. I'm going to do this Chrome tab. Ah, perfect. Oh, wow, this is actually so easy. Okay, great. So I am now sharing my screen, hopefully. Oh, wait, no. Ignore that, ignore that. Don't look at it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So happy May Day. I'm really excited to be talking about police and militarism and labor um, and like all of that together. But I have less than 20 minutes. So I'm just going to kind of dive straight into it. And I hope it's not like super overwhelming. Um, but yeah, I think that it's really important for us to also make sure that any conversation about prisons, um, it's absolutely important and integral that we talk about police and any conversation about police, we have to talk about militarism. Um, and it's all connected to labor. So I think that this is really important and I, I hope that um, I do some justice to sort of laying some sort of global framework and foundation for a lot of the conversations that are gonna come today throughout the day. And uh, yeah, let's dive right in. So first of all, um, I want to do something that I know is really uncomfortable or possibly could be uncomfortable to a lot of people just because in America, we don't really do a lot of this um, and it's looking at a map. And I think it's really, really important that we look at maps because um, uh, for many reasons, but first and foremost, I think that it's important because we don't realize sometimes that there is a world outside of the land that we live in. And it's really important that we contextualize the fact that we're actually an active empire living on stolen land, um, that everything that we're gonna be talking about today, the prisons, these cages that are built are actually on stolen land <laughs> on an active empire and why that's all important and relevant. So I, I'm specifically looking at this area of the world. I hope people can assume why. Um, and if anybody has come to, some of my other talks, you've probably seen this map a million times, so I hope you're able to answer these questions by now. But I'm gonna give people like two seconds on their own to try to identify, without opening up your own Google tab on the next tab, don't do it, um, where Waziristan is on this map. One, two, okay, two seconds, time is up. I'm going to assume safely that not only has not has most people not actually been able to identify with Zirisan on this map, but that they may not have even heard of that name before um, or that region. And I think that um, it's wildly important for us to know where Waziristan is or know that it exists because it's actually the most heavily drone striked area in the world by the United States. So the money that we pay um, living in this country to as taxes, a lot of that actually goes into militarism, the most most of it goes into militarism. And so we actually are paying to have people killed in Waziristan. So our money is going toward killing people in an area of the world that we didn't even know existed or can't point to on a map. And so I think that's sort of like the number one like framework of understanding that I really want to ground us in today is that um, we have really constructed 
um, an entire world that's heavily bordered just around the United States. We have very little conception of what's happening outside of the borders and very little desire, unfortunately, a lot of the times, even to understand why or where or who. Um, and so why I think it's really important to look at maps is that we can able to understand that we are actually actively partaking um, in this larger global empire and the ways in which it's all related, I think is super important. So um, hopefully at least people can identify Iran. <laughs> on this map, uh, which America is also administering horrible sanctions, and sanctions are a form of warfare. Um, but something else that's really important um, that I think is jarring usually when people have not heard of Waziristan um, or can't point to on a map is that like, it's, there's also a reason why you can't why well, you don't know that. There's a reason why we don't really hear voices of people from Waziristan, um, why we don't like see op-eds from people from Waziristan in the New York Times all the time. And that's because the United States is actively involved in a system of silencing, um, a system of silencing of people around the world, um, people living in Waziristan, people living in Somalia, people living in Sudan, places in which whose lived realities would actually fundamentally shatter the very existence um, or the very frameworks of what this country says that it's about or what it's doing with um, abroad, all of the democracies that it's spreading. Um, and to tie this a little bit into May Day again, I think garment workers also, which is a, a lot of my work is involved in sort of working alongside garment workers on a global scale. And we see that garment workers are also one of the most silenced, systemically silenced populations in the world. And, and it's really important for us to be thinking about that, given that many of us right now are sitting with clothes on, <laughs> possibly, um, who have no idea who made those clothes. And for many of us who are fasting, like what does it mean for us to be fasting right now, wearing clothes that are probably made in a violent sweatshop by other Muslim women? Um, and so I think that it's really important that we understand the ways in which our realities, as Sumeya also has mentioned right before this, um, so beautifully and eloquently, that there we have a sort of real a, a reality that has been morphed and shaped for us um, by this empire. And that extends to so many voices that are silenced globally. And as Arudanti Roy, the brilliant Indian author writes, there's no such thing as the voiceless, but the systemically silenced and preferably unheard. So I think when we're thinking about the ways in which we operate um, in the world and also locally, we have to first take into consideration how much um, of our world has been crafted for us. Um, how much of this has been intentionally set up um, in a way that is pushing a specific narrative, that America's military abroad is to keep us safe, militarism is safety, that borders are national security, that jails and cages are justice. And so all of these things that we've sort of normalized, I think are really, really important to really quickly unlearn and like sort of challenge. And so a lot of the things that we're gonna be hearing throughout the day today um, during this webinar, um, this day of action, might feel really radical to people, might feel like out of the blue or like, oh my God, how could that happen? Like, that's impossible. But I think that it allows all of those conversations to make a little bit more sense when we realize how normalized that we have created violence. And I think COVID right now is actually a very, very easy time to look around and see how things don't work, um, that jails aren't safe, that or else, you know, why would finally people would be decarcerating a little bit, um, that the systems that we are occupying aren't keeping us safe um, or else we wouldn't be having such a major crisis and be the number one, um, have the number one number of cases globally of COVID. So I think when we are able to really unlearn a lot of this, it's really, really important to be able to understand that this is also intentionally set up. So the first, I think one of the most important things to just ground this conversation right now, but then also the rest of the day is to understand that um, there is systems of silencing and there are false realities and there is really sort of this adjacent world that has been crafted for us that we have to actively work to denormalize um, and break down. And I think that's something that's really interesting that I always think about when I read this quote by George Orwell um, is that it feels also so in contradiction to Islam, that in Islam so many times throughout the Quran, we're told to just look around us and use our eyes and use our ears uh, of proof that of God's existence, of proof of the miracles of God. So I think that that is also when we're thinking about ways in which we can resist, I think that as we think throughout the entire day, we already have such a beautiful and powerful rubric that goes incredibly in opposition to this sort of hyper framing and hyper um, crafting of this like 
world of violence <laughs> that we currently live in. So that's the first sort of major point in understanding a lot of things that we're going to talk through today. The second is um, is that everything's historic, that nothing happens in isolation, um, that the reality that we live in today is a product of the history of the world and the history particularly of colonization. So this is a fun little map. Um, of colonization, and I know that we use this term a lot, so I just want to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of how we're defining it. And colonization, as according to Google's translation, <laughs> is uh, the act or process of settling, basically establishing control, appropriating a place or domination for one's own use. So when we look at a map of colonization 1914, you know, we have a generally a lot of us have an understanding that the world was colonized. Primarily, we look at um, Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, South America, and you know, as time goes on, the world is decolonizing. Mashallah, the only colonies or some of the colonies left are obviously the United States. We are a colony. Um, Israel, obviously, occupying Palestine, and both Pakistan and India occupying Kashmir, um, among other colonies existing today. But what I think is really interesting is that we look at this map and we look at the majority of the maps right now of the world and it seems like colonization is like finished, right? It's like this historic process that like, you know, we wiped our hands clean, like everyone's independent now, There's, they're free, the world is great. Um, but then when we think about, again, we want to go back to that first conversation we had about Waziristan, about garment workers particularly, and we see that the the conditions in which um, are required for garment workers to be silenced, the, these larger structures that are in place for these silencing methods to be happening globally makes us sort of ask the question, well, then how is it possible that we can't hear the voices of garment workers? How is it possible that a shirt can cost like $5 and like someone's hands actually went into it and it was shipped around the world and like there was a hundred trillion processes that went into creating that $5 shirt and that company is getting profit. Um, like how are those things all possible if there's no colonization? Um, the answer to that question is in this map, which I'll give you two seconds to guess. This map um, is actually a map of which looks very much like a little colonization map, if you want to compare that, is actually a map of US military bases around the world. America has 800 known military bases. That number is actually significantly higher with all of the black sites um, around the globe. And what is particularly interesting is like, of course, you know, America loves to say that it's spreading democracy um, and that the military is just like this like random other arm of the country that gets so much money, but like has no really no relationship to us. Um, but when we, Oh yeah, also we've been at war for like forever. Um, but when we also map on the the map of military, like America's military bases with like this horrible map that I made of major sites of fast fashion supply chains, for example, which again um, are sort of maintaining global poverty, we see a lot of even the exact same countries. We see Honduras, Burkina Faso, um, Thailand, the Philippines, just as we see on this map. Um, and so when we look at, and we, if we can put any map over here, really, like this is a map of climate change that's happening globally. The intense acts are, again, very much overlap with US military bases. Um, we see that the United States military democracy, do you like this meme? I mean, this, I'm proud of this meme. Um, America's military um, is actually involved in a form of colonization and an ongoing form of colonization um, in a way that, as we defined it, is requiring this sort of constant subjugation of people and shaping bodies in order to create profit, in order to create products for us, in order to really um, exert dominance and power in a way that crafts the world and controls the world um, and oppressed communities and particularly labor in a way that is building up the United States particularly. Um, and so when we see this wonderful, wonderful map um, and we think about the ways in which the United States military uses all of our resources that are also stolen from all these countries uh, to sort of work um, in maintaining global power. We can also see, and we've, sorry, the question that we should be asking is like, well, then how does that happen, right? Like a military base doesn't mean that like everybody around there are like in sweatshops. But when we look at the, the means and the methods in which we actually can understand um, power dynamics and controlling power, we can look at prisons and jails and um, the ways in which bodies, again, are controlled sort of on a more localized, more in ta very tangible way. Um, so we see that right now it, in China, in Western China, so or East Turkmenistan, however 
you drink your drink. Um, mass Uyghur Muslims are right now in concentration camps and Nike, Adidas and Apple are actually profiting from Uyghur labor in concentration camps in China. That um, raw materials for Nike apparel are actually harvested by Muslims in concentration camps in China. And so it's mind blowing, right? And a lot of us are just like, oh my gosh, that's awful, which it is. And we are, it's very clear that what's happening is deeply devastating, that it's deeply unjust. Um, concentration camps should not exist, it's forced labor. And this is a, a, an article from Forbes magazine. Um, but I think what is really important is that when we, uh, when we want to take a step back and take this global and really localize it, is that this isn't just happening. Um, in China, this isn't just happening in like concentration camps that we can all agree are atrocious. This is happening everywhere. And particularly in prisons in the United States, there is a lot of prison labor that happens. Um, and people who write horrible op-eds in the New York Times have to actually ask the question if it's ethical. It is not, let me be very, <laughs> it is not ethical. Let's answer that question now. Um, because again, this is forced labor. This is the way in which labor and power is being exerted to control bodies um, for the empire. Um, and so we look at fun things, look at that, protective military gear. These are some things that are made in, um, in jails in the United States. So protective military gear, law enforcement equipment. Also, is that not like uncomfortably ironic that law enforcement equipment is literally being made um, by people who are incarcerated, like, and also not getting paid, like getting paid very little to nothing in a lot of these cases. Also McDonald's uniforms, again, we gotta always bring in the fashion. Um, and so when we look at the ways in which all of these are so deeply connected, this militarism, creating spaces um, and sort of ongoing colonialism to allow for places like sweatshops to exist, and also labor happening in jails. Um, we see this sort of coming full circle with the ways in which um, actual apparel and actual military gear and equipment are made in jails in the United States and globally. And it's also dreadfully apparent when we look at an image like this that looks like it is probably from Iraq or looks like it's somewhere like in the Middle East in an undisclosed location, but this is actually in Ferguson um, in the United States. And and a lot of people kind of see these and specifically communities of color, specifically back black communities and working class communities are not actually, this is not like a very shocking image because there is actually direct links even closer between militarism and police and prisons when we see a lot of the equipment are actually shared. Um, there are, is a Pentagon bill that allows surplus military equipment to come to local police forces. We see the same sort of surveillance technology, the same tech companies working inside prisons, also supporting apartheid Israel. Um, we see, and that's why the lines between all of these in institutions or, um, like sites of violence are actually deeply connected on a global scale. So those lines are so wildly blurred. Um, and I think that it's it feels really, really like terrifying and like it gives us a lot of anxiety and it, it is horrifying and it's awful. <laughs> um, but at the same time, what I think is really powerful from knowing how interconnected that these companies are, um, interconnected that America's military is to the police, that America's empire is analogous to the ways in which America's police act as a military in black and brown communities, um, sweatshops and prisons, the ways in which all of these are so tied together, I think it also makes for really, really powerful modes of organizing. And what I think is really, really, I guess I don't wanna use the word beautiful, but I'm gonna use the word beautiful, <laughs> is that that also does not allow us to just say like, oh yeah, like as a non-black Muslim, I should say Black Lives Matter, like, woo, I'm so radical, I'm so hip. But like, actually we can, when we understand how deeply related um, all of these institutions are that oppress our people, we can understand that we actually have to under, like eradicate the systems that perpetuate anti-blackness in order for me as a non-black Muslim to also um, like end the, America's military presence um, around Iran or against my people directly. So when we also can understand the ways in which things are connected, we can understand ways that we can actually work together and collaborate and really build intersectional um, struggles for liberation. And so what I really love about Believer's Bailout is that this is sort of, I think, the framework of how we need to be moving forward is that we have to be able to imagine what another world could look like and actively working toward building that. And it's, a, it's not just like an imaginary 
sort of situation, but it's like a practice ethos. Um, and also, as mentioned earlier, um, and I know won't be mentioned a million times <laughs> today, is that this is something that our faith actually does require, um, is that we have to be fighting against oppression, fighting against injustice, regardless of who it is or who it is against, um, by virtue of being Muslim. And something that for me is always sort of like a touch point and like a very grounding moment, um, but also a very difficult thing to think about is that if the prophet, peace be upon him, was alive today, living in the United States, would he be paying taxes? Like, would he actually be part of this empire? Would he move? You know, like, I think that there's something that is really, really important for us to also contextualize our faith within the world that we live in and understanding um, how someone who we, you know, we always theoretically or theologically say that we model, of course, um, or aspire our best um, efforts to model after the prophet or the Ahlubayt and um, everyone who we really love and respect um, within the faith. But do we actually like would they would the prophet be wearing sweatshop made clothes um would the prophet be paying taxes and I, every time i start having those conversations with myself i realize that like the prophet if he was living in the united states today i can almost certainly say would currently be incarcerated um because i do not believe the prophet would be paying taxes because taxes are so unjust in this country they're going toward militarism they're going toward war um and so if we can even think about the ways in which uh, some of the the people who we love, the people who we m want to model and who we want to respect and, and have so much love for in our own um, religious tradition, if we can imagine them alive today and we sort of like map out like or think through what their actions would be like and they would be in jail. I think that that's something that's so important for us to also sort of frame and ground ourselves in um, and not just our work at Believers Bailout, but also the ways in which we think about people who are currently incarcerated. Um, we think about the people uh, who are otherized or think about the people who are systemically silenced because there is again a reason for all of the ways in which, I'm gonna stop this, this is the, my last slide. Um, exit? No. How do I get out of this? Okay. Am I still scaring my screen? No. Okay. There's a reason <laughs> why all of this is sort of in conversation with each other. And I think why it's so important to bring Islam into this is because it actually allows us to ground um, all of these connections and also the ways in which we think about the these alternative realities that we live in. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, and pass it on. And I'm really grateful for everything that's happening. Oh, I'm one minute over. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. Thank you for being here. And if anyone has any questions, I'm on Twitter. We can talk. And yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Hoda. Thank you, Hoda.